Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the 9th of the 11th month on our Creator's calendar for how we reckon it in regards to the Zadok calendar. And that is the 20th of January, 2024. We are continuing in our reading of Bereshit or Genesis, and we are currently on chapter 29. Yaakov had sold uh, his brother some porridge for his birthright, and then he had went ahead and, at the instigation of his mother, went in deceptively and got the baraka from his father after he had eaten the meal and was pleased within his soul. So those things culminating, Esau being unhappy, he threatens to put to death his brother at the end of his father's life, and his mother, hearing about it, convinces his father to send Yaakov off to her family so he can be away while his brother's cooling off. All of these things are foreshadowing future events while they're also literally true in their lives. It, I just want you to keep that in mind. The more you see these things, the more it makes sense. But with Yaakov specifically, he was type and shadow of the first coming of our Mashiach, just as in Moshe. And that's pointed out directly by Kepha in the recognitions. This type, as we'll see, is the one who goes out of the land to labor for the things that are his own possession to come back with after he returns. Pretty easy to see that picture. Some things to keep in mind that you might not be aware of, though. And I hadn't known that until recently, but Rachel or Rachel means an ewe or a sheep. And Leah means to be weary. So Yaakov is he who has coming at the hill of what he's doing. Remember, these things all play a part. All right. So with that in mind, we will get in our narrative here. It says... And Yaakov moved on and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field and saw three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks, and a large stone was on the well's mouth. And all the flocks would be gathered there. Then they would roll the stone back in its place eth the sheep, and put eth the stone from the well's mouth, and water eth on the well's mouth. I think that got messed up. I'll have, no, it, it, the Aleph Tau is put before the sheep, the stone, and I believe the water of the well's mouth. So I have to double check that one. But these are all significant because the Aleph Tau is claiming that as his own, if you remember. So it says, so Jacob said to them, My brothers, from where are eth you? And they said, We are from Haran. And Haran was the city, if you recall, the name of Abraham's brother who died in the fire when Tehor, his, his father, left Babylon and went to Armenia, or Syria as we call it, and founded the city named Haran after his son. And he said to them, Do you know Eth Laban, son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. So he said to them, Is he well? And they said, Well. And see, his daughter Rachel, or Rachel, is coming with the sheep. And he said, See, the day is great, not the time for the livestock to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and pasture them. But they said, We are not allowed until all the flocks are gathered together. So they have rolled at the stone from the well's mouth. Or sorry, and they have rolled at the stone from the well's mouth. Then we shall water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel 
came up or came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to be when Yaakov saw Eth Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and Eth the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Yaakov went near and rolled Eth the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And Yaakov kissed Rachel and lifted up Eth his voice and wept. And when Yaakov told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rivka or Rebekah's son, she ran and told her father. And it came to be, when heard Laban at the report about Yaakov, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him, and embraced him, and kissed him, and brought him to his house. Now, you remember, or if you don't, I'll let you know, we had already had the encounter with Abraham's servant being sent to get a, a, a wife from that family for Abraham's son Yitzhak. And if you recall, there was miraculous things that happened during that time with the events that he had prayed for and then the immediacy of it happening, his praying and belief, and all the events that followed because of that. So while they were idolaters, they were familiar with the power of Elohim moving in Abraham's family. And they had been familiar with it on the occasion before he left, when his servant came. And once again, they're going to see some here. But Laban, knowing that, is something that comes up later on, which might not be known. But in the covenant that he makes with Yaakov, he's very specific about something. And I think that's because he knows who uh, is really dealing and treating Yaakov well. Then it came to be, when heard Laban at the report about Yaakov, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he recounted unto Laban, Eth, all these matters, or all these words. And Laban said to him, Surely, Eth, you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a chodesh of days or a month of days, literally a renewal of days. Then Laban said to Yaakov, Because if you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for naught? Let me know, what should your hire be? That word there for wages is the same word for a hire that we'll see later on. And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, which means weary again. And the name of the younger was Rachel, or Rachel, which is an eel lamb. And Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel, or Rachel's, was beautiful of form and beautiful of her means to see. The literal translation of the Hebrew. Okay. And Yaakov loved Eth Rachel. So he said, Let me serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give Eth her to you than that I should give Eth her to another man. Stay with me. So Yaakov served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but as days united because of the love he had for her, or for Eth, her. It, they say as one day, right? But it's literally as days united. Then Yaakov said to Laban, Give me Eth, my wife, or my days are completed. And let me go in to her. And Laban gathered Eth all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to be in the evening 
that he took Athlea his daughter and brought her to him. And he went in to her, and Laban gave his female servant Ath Zilpha to his daughter Leah as a female servant. While we're going through this, I'd like you to keep in mind that while Jacob was obedient to his mother at the instigation of Abraham, telling her to do all things in accordance with looking out for him, for her love for him, which we'll find in the book of Yobelim, it was still Jacob's choice to deceive and to um, surplant in a manner that was unbecoming. And while he could not be cursed by his father because he'd already gotten the Baraka, he did have his own ways turned back on him. And he's recompensed for the things that he does in his own life by others doing it to him. This is how reality functions. That is his namesake. And everybody who is not a malicious sinner, this is what happens to you. If you're malicious and you're sinning, then your punishment is held off into a, you know, a further time, as Kepha mentions in the recognitions of Clement. But some people, you also find it in the Psalms and other places where it talks about the rich man or the powerful or those that are waxing strong and doing evil don't suffer like other men in their lives, but they get it at the end, right? Anyways, I want you to keep in mind that as he did, it's done unto him. As there's contentions and strifes within his family, as the, the wives are bickering and fighting, and the things play out in the children in a larger scale later on as well. So keep these things in mind, because what you're seeing is a foreshadow of world history in a microcosm. This is, and in the morning it came to be, that see, it was Leah. So he said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, It is not done this way in our place to give the little or insignificant before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, then we give you also at this one, for the service which you shall serve me, still another seven years. And Yaakov did so, and completed her week. Then he gave him his daughter at Rachel as wife, and Laban gave his female servant at Bilhah, to his daughter Rachel as a female servant. And he also went in to Rachel, and he also loved Eth Rachel more than Leah. And he served with Laban still another seven years. And Yahuwah, I have one there that didn't get corrected, sorry about that. And Yahuwah saw that Leah was hated, and he opened at her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived, so again, who, who opens the womb or closes it? Who is the one that possesses every one of these that are in covenant? He marks his, his stamp before them all, right? And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, Reuben, right? For she said, for Yahuwah has looked, right? That has looked as Ru, right? Upon my affliction, because now my husband is going to love me. And that's literally, behold, you know, behold the son. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because Yahuwah has heard that I am hated, he gave me also Eth this son. So she called his name Shimon, because he's heard, right? And she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband is joined to me. 
because I have borne him three sons. So she named, or so his name was called Louis. Now they say Levi today or Levi, right? There's also Louis here. And then they have the, if you look at the ISR, it's Louis with L-E-W-I. And I'm not going to tell you that any of those are incorrect because all of those are derivatives from this very name. It's just how the language has changed depending on where it went. So it's an interesting phenomenon. I tend to use Louis because the V sound for the WA is a um, modern addition after the Babylonian captivity. And before that, the V sound was exclusive to the bet on occasion. <clears throat> But anyone that says Louis or Levi, you're, you're getting the same words from the same name. It's really nitpicky. She said, and she conceived again and bore a son and said, now I praise Eth Yahuwah. So she called his name Yahudah. And she ceased bearing. That now I praise is Hudu. Eth Yahuwah, right? To praise, confess, or acknowledge Yahuwah is Hudu. And you put Yahuda is to confess, acknowledge, or praise Yah, which is what she had and why he was named such. So chapter 30. And afterwards, I also have the strongs for these. I'll send the link with the video in the descriptions and I'll I'll send it to the chat. But you want to take the time to look through it. If you're not familiar with Hebrew, you can use an online interlinear. And even if they don't have the things translated in the English correctly, like you'll see with the household idols, you can click on the Strong's link, find the, what the word means, and then continue to dig from there. Um, we'll get to that one when we do, but... Some of these words, they'll say, have an unknown origin. And you just have to look for the root, the Hebrew root, in the etymological dictionary that, from Ernest Klein, for example. And then you can see what those things mean. So sometimes it takes a little bit of digging, but the truth is available for those who seek it. Right. Chapter 30 says, And when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister, and said to Jacob, Give me children, or else I am going to die. Right? Bitter towards her husband, because she's envying her sister, and all of this has to do with these sisters being married to the same man. Something that was not established from the beginning was never given as his will, and is actually prohibited to renewed covenant believers. We can see the effects of these things here, but as there was no Torah against it, there was no sin, which is why you never see him convicted of wrong for it. That doesn't mean that he did not have the problems in his life. And that is part of the natural law that teaches man with a reasonable mind. Okay? And Jacob's displeasure burned against Rachel or Rachel. And he I'm said... Sorry. Was I, can I just ask a question about that? Yes, ma'am. Because we have a lot of folks coming out and saying, you know, that this is what they're, you know, going to be doing because essentially Jacob did, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. so because it's not in Torah, it wasn't a sin for him. But when Messiah came, did he kind of, Bring it back to the beginning of what Yah intended, um, and then thus annulling. So we see so many problems with you know their relationship here. Um, so is it a sin today if people take multiple wives? I'm just curious. Thank you for your question there, and I'm sure many people have that. That's exactly the problem that we have the, with a lot of these things. You have, just in the common scriptures by themselves, if you read it with an open mind, you have inconsistent instructions just with this very topic of marriage. He changes his rules 
or men in time. Why he does that is for his own purposes, but the fact that it happens is unequivocal unless you just choose not to believe what is written, in which case that's your choice, but it says, blessed is he who's not condemned in what he approves. So we have to be careful about things. But there's facts. When he established things from creation, it was male and female. He created them. They went two by two into the ark, not two by three or five or six, right? And these very things are established reality. Men of their own choice took extra wives that was never commanded, never approved. And, it, and as you can read, there were problems from it. The instructions that he did give after the children were given the Torah were reflecting the conditions of the time. And this is the thing that we have to remember. He is the truth. He can only show forth of himself what is. So while they were in the condition of, and this is why it was made this way, the first covenant where they had broken it with the golden calf and he had said, let me wipe them out and make Moshe a greater nation. He forgave them that, but he had to institute the forced sacrifices, the intentional obligations, the mandatory purgations to teach them righteousness as a trainer. When he, he, Part of that was giving divorce, and he himself divorced the northern kingdom and kicked them out. That was why this was established. And then the idea that the man had to die before she can remarry was what he did to bring them back. And then when he did that, as he said, when he was in the flesh, he made a new way. There is no more divorce. You separate for idolatry and adultery, and you give them room for repentance. Because that is the truth, the condition in which he was living out. So the very fact that he has changed to accommodate man, he changed the rules that we are to follow in his example. He's done that with a few things, like how the, how the feasts are observed, how Moshe, or sorry, how Noah and Abraham and Yitzhak kept the feasts before going into Mitzrayim was different from how Moshe was establishing it with the Exodus, which was different from the laws that they had to keep in the land. But it was all keeping the appointed times that he wanted. That's the point. So we have to keep in mind that these things are, are facts. And we can't be dogmatic and say, oh, well, he said that and there is no changing it ever. There's doing, there is no going against what he said. That's why, that's why Shaul said the circumcision is nothing. The circumcision is nothing, but guarding the commands is what matters. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it explicitly says that the men of knowledge and, and wisdom, the men of intelligence, will diligently search through the statutes and find out what you're applicable for their times, not and follow everything that they see. Because not everything, it, it's not possible to do any sacrifices today. He is all sufficient for our needs. You don't, you don't build an altar. You don't kill an animal and, and offer it. You might slaughter an animal to cook, but you do not sacrifice. There is a distinction. If we choose not to believe that, then we've, we've chosen to not believe the truth that was given. And the key here, this is the important thing. If there's two or more witnesses plainly that establish the fact and you forsake it, you're doing that with the truth that you're accountable for. Because he said that's how things are established. Right? So people can believe what they want, but we, we want to be careful to actually believe what he said, how he said it. And that's only by taking things reasonably and when you have it in a cohesive chronological order. That's why we're trying to go from the beginning through and have everything, what was known at the time, readily available so you can see how they acted, what they knew, and the consequences for their choices, good or bad, right? But See, right here, Matthew 18 on the adultery business. Yes, and also in the Shepherd of Hermas, he goes into detail about 
the conditions particular to today or our times that go right in line with what's in Matithiahu there. So thank you for that. And for a third witness, you have the Dead Sea Scrolls, the exhortation which goes into detail about Dawid having multiple wives and not knowing because the Book of the Covenant was hidden in the Ark until the coming of Zadok. So it was not attributed to him as a sin. But they give you the reasoning why it's male, one and only. And one it tells you directly in the exhortation from the Damascus document that acquiring another wife while the first one is still alive is a contrivance of Satan to deceive righteous believers so you can take that for what it is but um back on track here it says in Jacob's displeasure burned against Rachel or Rachel and he said oh yes sister you're free to speak I just wanted to clarify that not all sacrifices are done away with. And that is shown by the fact that Paul went to the temple to separate a Nazarite vow with four men. And that was after Yeshua's death because it's written in Acts 8. Because there was some contentions in the community that Paul was unlawful and that he didn't keep the law of Moses. And so they came together to decide, what shall we do with this matter? And he said there were four men here with a vow on them. And pay charges or be at charges with them means pay for the sacrifices. Go to the temple to show them that you are loyal to the law. Yeah. So um, this sacrifice happened after Yeshua's death in the temple. So... It needs more investigation. Thank you for that. And we also have the examples of when he cleansed lepers before he died and told them to go present the offerings as prescribed by Moshe. And we have the circumcision that Shaul participated with the half Greek individual. All those happen for a specific reason as well. Irenaeus or Irenaeus explains that the cleansing of the lepers was to show that he never did away with the Torah. It was still enjoined and he had them doing the things and the offerings um, because it was, it was his will. When the temple was destroyed, it was his will. And the fact that that is impossible now is also his will. He foretold the very thing of removing the temple so that the sacrifices would be done and over with because they would not stop on their own. And that was what was upsetting to the um, the Pharisees and scribes when the taught ones were talking about that in the recognitions of Clement when they first get together. But the reason for the vow, for example, is to prove that he was not disobedient to the truth, because you can't be a Nazarite in hypocrisy. You would be judged. He would have curses and problems. And also... For the, um, the circumcision of the gentleman, I think it was, I don't know if it was Timothy, but he wanted, and he tells in his epistle, he wanted him to be with him everywhere that he went, including to the Hekel. And while he was a Hebrew by birth, he, was, he had to be circumcised to be able to enter. So there was the reason behind that. But he didn't make all the Gentiles circumcise themselves because they weren't going into the inner parts of the Hekel where that was even possible or a requirement for them. After that was destroyed, then that, again, it's impossible to do. But those things and everything in his word all happen. They are true, and there are reasons for them. So I really appreciate that you brought that up, and I'd appreciate any time someone has stuff like that come to mind that you bring it up, because sometimes it's, you know, I don't think about it, and it is something that is important. So thank you. So he says, back to right here, Yaakov's displeasure burned, and he said, Am I in the place of Elohim, who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Right? She's upset with him, and he's upset because he has no power to do that. He's like, why are you getting mad at me? <laughs> right? And she said, See, my female servant, Bilhah, 
Go in to her and let her bear for me, and let me be built up from her as well. Now, this is an echo, the pattern, if you will, from Abraham and Sarah with Hagar. And you'll see this kind of thing, a surrogate kind of thing happen over and over, just like the pattern of having a child in old age, first with Noah, then with Abraham, then with Yitzhak, then with Jacob, later with um, Eleazar, or Eleazar and his wife. The um, There's other echoes and patterns in the patriarchs and then in the children to which they belong. The kinsman redeemer pattern, for example, went to Yahuda, but you can see it beforehand as well. <clears throat> So just something to keep in mind here. This is an echo like this, the, the father's ways being put out on the children again. These things happen to us in reality as well. So she gave him Eth, Bilhah, her female servant as wife. And Yaakov went into her and Bilhah conceived and bore Yaakov a son. And Rachel said, Elohim has judged me and also heard my voice and given me a son. So she called his name Dan, which means judge. Now, this is the literal. And if you keep in mind what happens with him as a tribe, they leave out early. His sons, most all of them, but one die going into Mitzrayim. He ends up hating Yahusuf in his heart and do, being angry with him for a while and trying to kill him when they're persecuting him. And that reflects in his children. And it, it all is precipitated from the envy, the bitterness, and the things that begat his coming into this world. To the point that in his testament, he bemoans that most of his children are not going to be in covenant. And after they get into the land, they shortly leave. They became the Danoi of the Greeks. They attacked their own brothers and sacked Troy. They went over to Ireland and became the, um, the Baal worshippers until they became Catholics for a very long time. Predominantly in idolatry and evil because of the way that they behaved. Not all of them, but the majority. All because of this. And foretold in their children, or foretold to them, in their life and then talk to them and their children we'll get to that when you see the the testament of dan and it's actually dan that's in league with louis and called the antichrist by hippolytus the taught one of Irenaeus, in his hair against i'm um, sorry refutation of all heresies it it goes into a lot of detail about that but he would be the yahuda ishkiriot representation as a tribe if you want to be technical pre-messianic times when he came obviously his own rejected him and that was a different thing but it says and rachel or rachel's female servant bilha conceived again and bore yaakov a second son and rachel or rachel said wrestlings of elohim i have wrestled with my sister and i have overcome so she called his name naphtali literal translation okay what it means i'm not going to tell you you guys think about it these are all parables that's the point right this is and leah saw that she had ceased bearing and she took eth zil for her female servant and gave her to yaakob his wife and leah's female servant zilpha bore yaakob a son and leah said in fortune come fortune So she called Eth his name Gad. And Leah's female servant Zilpha, or Zilpa, right, bore Yaakov a second son. And Leah said, I am happy, for the daughters shall call me happy. So she called Eth his name Asher, which is happy. But it also means to be confirmed, strengthened, authenticated, walking straight, prosperous, and blessed. So I tend to believe that it means that you're authenticated 
in walking straight and confirmed by being blessed and happy, right? <clears throat> and Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes or love apples and brought or in the field and brought eth them to his mother Leah. That word love apples there is rather interesting, but it's related to the word for beloved. Okay, it's like our Mashiach is the title for Dawid or David is beloved, which is a code name or another title for our Mashiach throughout the covenant writings. And the, um, the body of the beloved, as you know, are the believers. So right here is a representation of the beloved or Dodi at the harvest and what happens. So something very interesting to pay attention to when you consider the martyrs and the things like that, okay? Reuben being France. Okay. But it says, And Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest and found mandrakes or love apples in the field and brought eth them to his mother Leah. And Rachel said to Leah, Give now unto me some of your son's love apples. But she said to her, Is it insignificant that you have taken away Eth my husband? Would you take away my son's Eth love apples too? And Rachel said, Therefore let him lie with you tonight for your son's love apples. And when Yaakov, so without needing to, she made a deal, but she wanted to say, You can have our husband tonight if you give me some of those. Okay, and she made the agreement to do so. She didn't have to, but she did. Leah took that opportunity, and according to the words that they had established, Yahuwah did for them. And Rachel, we find out in the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, and possibly, I believe it, there's some mention of the incident in the book of Yobelim. She offers these to Yahuwah. She doesn't eat them. But in the affliction of her being for not having children, she offers them. And the children that would have been Leah's, two of them, because of the two nights there, were given to Rachel for the offering that she did here. Otherwise, she would not have had them because of the envy and bitterness and the contentions and things going on. So when she humbled herself, things changed. But Another, her sister, actually squandered her inheritance or what was hers by right by being careless with what she was doing. Something for us to keep in mind as well. Sorry about that. And it says, And Rachel said, let him, Therefore let him lie with you tonight for your son's love apples. And when Jacob came out of the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, Do come in to me for hire. I have hired you with the love, ap love apples of my son. And he lay with her that night. And Elohim listened to Leah. And she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. And Leah said, Elohim has given me my hire because I have given my female servant to my husband. So she called his name Yishakar. And Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, Endowed Elohim eth me with a tov endowment. Now my husband is going to dwell with me, because I have borne him six sons. So she called eth his name Zebulun. And afterward she bore a daughter and called eth her name Dina. And it doesn't say that explicitly, but Zebulun and Dina are twins. And that was the pattern from Jacob and Esau being twins carried down as well. Not to all of them, but you can see it there. And that is also part of the constellations in the book of Yobelim. Jacob's foretold to have children like the stars, right? And it's literally the constellations, the 12 sons representing the 12 constellations. 
even in their birth, although how it's established here isn't how he later sets it up with Shimon and Louis being part of what we call Gemini because they didn't have the inheritance but were together. And then it's later on put in a different way with um, their offices and how they're addressed. So those very things and how they relate to the constellations are also foreshadowed in the emissaries when they came. And that like our Mashiach being the light of the world, like the bridegroom, Psalm 19, which is the sun or the greater light that came. He set up the kingdom like the moon and set up his taught ones, the stars and the assemblies, which are the, like the deacons. So all of that played out in the same fashion as a foreshadowing of what Moshe had established, just like the picture above in the sky, which was the promise Yahuwah gave to Abraham that his seed would be like the stars of the Shemaim. But getting back on here, sorry. It says, And Elohim remembered Eth Rachel, and Elohim listened to her and opened Eth her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, I add Elohim, Eth my reproach. So she called Eth his name Yahusuf and said, Yahuwah has added to me another son. So she had made her complaints known or her reproach known to Yahuwah by her offering that we will find in, I believe that is in the book of Yobelin. It might be in the Testaments, but it's not here that it's mentioned that she offered that to him and didn't eat it herself. However, she admits it here that she laid her reproach to him and he rewarded her with a son. So she named him Yahuwah has added, or Yahuwah adds or collects or gathers, if you will. <clears throat> and it came to be when Rachel had born Eth Yahusuf that Yaakob said to Laban, Send me on my way to go to my own place and to my land. Give Eth my wives and my children whom I have served, Eth you for them, and let me go. For Eth, you yourself know, Eth, my service, which I have done for you. And Laban said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, stay, for I have learned by divination that he baruch me, Yahuwah, for your sake. It literally says, in rolling unto you, bigola, bigolek, right? Bigolek. But in bet, rolling, gimelamed, unto you. They translate, for your sake. But in reality, Laban was prospered so that it would roll onto Yaakob because he was the one being favored. And said, Name, literally, pierce your hire upon me, and eth I give her. So he said to him, Eth, you know, Eth, how I have served you, and Eth, how your livestock has been, Eth, with me. For the little you had before my face has broke forth greatly, and he, Barak, Yahuwah, Eth, you concerning my treading, literally his regal, his, his that word for um, a foot in the... Um, the Leo or Lion constellation, Regulus, they call it, is the foot of Leo. That's where we get the word for royalty, regalia, regulations, regular. It's the the three regalim or the three feasts that you go up to were the regular feasts that you would attend, your regular mode of life for the being in the land. That's where that word comes from, but it's literally your foot or where you're treading. So now you know if you didn't. <clears throat> and if you if you want to, please look that up too. Again, I'll have the strongs um, for each chapter that we read in the description, and I'll send it to you afterwards so you can compare these things for yourself. It says, but now when am I to provide for my own house too? And he said, What eth shall I give unto you? And Yaakob said, Give me not, 
If you do this for me, I shall again feed and guard your flocks. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the black ones among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the goats. So all the unclean or all the ones of uh, the black, the, the mixed, the non-pure white ones. Pretty simple to, to see that, right? And these shall be my hire, and my righteousness shall answer for me in the time to come. When you come concerning my hire, everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, it is stolen if it is eth with me. He, he came to save that which was lost, right? He everyone that says they are not sinning is a liar and the truth is not in them. <clears throat> and Laban said, See, let it be according to your word. And on that day he set aside eth the male goats that were speckled and spotted, and eth all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had some white in it, and all the black ones among the lambs, and gave them into the hand of his sons. And he put three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed eth the flocks of Laban, or Laban's, the remnant or remainder. And Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and green white trees, okay? And of the poplar is a white tree. Lebanus, the same thing with Laban's name, means white. Just so you know, I, I had to look these up because I wanted to be peculiar about the words there. It says, And Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and of the almond and chestnut trees, peeled white strips in them, and exposed the white which was in the rods. And he set eth the rods which he had peeled before the flocks in the gutters, or the troughs, right? In the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink. And they conceived when they came to drink. So the flocks conceived before the rods, and the flocks brought forth streaked, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the streaked, and all the black in the flock of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves, and did not put them with Laban's flock. There's a lot of contentions or a lot of ideas about what these things mean, and that he was being deceptive and doing stuff with this, but he literally has a dream and is told to do these things by the messenger Elohim, which we'll see. It, you don't see it here, but it's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. He has a dream here, and he has a dream when he's supposed to leave, but he's guided by messengers, and that's something that you see foretold about before, too, and there's pictures behind it. So you can't see it as clearly right now, but we'll get to it when we get to the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you'll see it in Yobelim. <clears throat> he's doing these things by command, but what you can see here that should be very clear is he's using these sticks not to cause them to breed a certain way. He cannot control how they come out of the womb. That is entirely our Creator's doing as a right ruling, as a right, you call it justice, if you will, or making right the um, the mistreatment that Jacob's receiving. But right here you'll see that he uses these things for a particular reason um, to allow them to breed when they drink the water. It promotes the uh, the thing for it. And he does it with his flocks that are peculiar, the ones that join together he causes to breed, and the ones that turn aside he doesn't. So he's it's what we call selective breeding. We do it with animals and fruit all the time to get desirable traits. And he was doing that to get these animals that would stay flocked together. So it's in the literal Hebrew here, and I, it was completely muddied up in the English, but you'll see it in just a moment. 
And it came to be whenever those that stayed together of the flock conceived that Yaakov placed the rods before the eyes of the flocks or flock in the gutters, so they would conceive among the rods. But in those that turn aside from the flocks or of the flocks, he did not put them in. So those that turned aside were unto Laban, and those that stayed together unto Yaakov. Okay. And these are the ones that would be streaked, spotted, and speckled for him. And the ones that did not stay together, but would turn aside, or that would leave the flock, he would not do that with, and those would be unto Laban. It says, Thus the man increased very much, and had many flocks, and female and male servants, and camels, and donkeys. All right. Um. I think that might have to do it for this one. We have to break up for questions after this, and then we'll probably continue next week where we'll get the rest of this, his uh, encounters with Laban, and then the return into the land. So until that time, thank you all for your time. You have a wonderful rest of your Shabbat, and uh, Shavuot Tov, Tov week ahead.